launch. Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for waiting. We're so sorry we're a little bit late. My name is Hamish Sewell. I'm the founder of SoundTrails. And SoundTrails is a locative platform that has been successfully operating for nine years now. And we're all about supporting producers and community around the world to produce compelling locative audio experiences, either on commission or through licenses. SoundTrails is also a sponsor today of this Walk, Listen Cafe event. And of course, Walk, Listen, Create are involved in the uh, really important SoundWalk September event too, which is coming up. And today I'm very happy to be talking with Andrea Zafiro about the quite remarkable Headmap Manifesto, which in 1999 was written and inspired a generation of locative media practitioners, artists and academics. Before we begin, I just want to point out that today's format's a little bit different than the usual Walk, Listen, Create Cafe in that this is one of two events. The second event will be on the 16th, that's Australian Eastern Time, that's the 15th uh, for you guys in the Northern Hemisphere, will be with Jason Farman, and that's around the whole contention and, and discussion around locative maps. The second point is that today we're going to field questions slightly differently in that we're going to field them through the YouTube portal. So um, if you do have questions, please um, uh, put them up there. We'll take the first questions that come in, but we'll uh, field those questions from the second half of this talk on. Also, I'd like to just acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the Sunshine Coast here in Queensland, and I've got the support of the wonderful producers here from uh, the Stories on the Red Couch, which is uh, where I am at the production studio. And I also, too, want to acknowledge that um, this whole idea of, of locative media is really couched in this connection that we have to place. And, of course, here in the Sunshine Coast, the Cubby Cubby people have a connection that goes back literally tens of thousands of years here. So if we're talking about meaning making, if we're talking about sort of notion of, of storytelling and connection to home, then I think we can't ignore the fact that um, uh, this is a really intrinsic and deep connection that these people have to the land. And I just want to pay my respects to, to them and their elders past, present and future. So now I'd like to introduce Andrea Zafiro. Andrea is the Academic Director for the Sherman Centre for Digital Scholarship and Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication Studies and Media Arts at McMaster University in Canada. For 15 years, Andrea has collaborated in transdisciplinary research network and engaged in cre the creation of mobile and locative media from immersive experiences responsive installations, and virtual reality. And Andrea and I, I hasten to say, are also both on the advisory panel with the Walk, Listen, Create team. Hi, Andrea. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. Andrea, I first came across your work through your essay, uh, A Location of One's Own, A Genealogy of Locative Media. And I have to say, this was quite a, a sort of an important document for me because I was really struggling at this stage to sort of understand the work that I've been doing with sound trails within a broader context. And I didn't really know how to unpack it. I didn't really understand what locative media meant. I didn't know who was working in this field or what people were really putting out there. And I think when I read your essay, it really drew my attention to the fact that since the, the, the 1990s really, there was this whole school of, of, of sort of disruptors, academics, artists who were, who were really playing in this area. But also, too, I think, just as importantly, I, I was kind of aware of this, this thing called the Headmap Manifesto and, and Ben Russell. So just kind of in brief, you know, who was Ben Russell? What was the Headmap Manifesto? And what were these guys responding to at the time? Oh, I actually don't know a lot about um, Ben Russell. Um, for some reason, I, I have it in my mind that he's also an experimental filmmaker, but I could I could be completely um, wrong about that. So I'm going to kind of 
push that to the side, but also kind of talk about, um, you know, this question about what it was possibly responding to at the time. You know, I think um, when I first came, um, came across it, it was in 2005, and I think it had already gone through about two or so iterations. Um, and it was probably through the work of, of locative media artists at the time, and I want to say Mark Tudors. Um, and Tudors, along with people like Drew Hemant, Tessas Varnellis, Anne Galloway, Simon Pope, and I'm certain I'm forgetting names, and I apologize. These were artists and, and researchers who were um, writing about uh, and producing uh, locative media as it was unfolding um, in real time. And so I think, you know, revisiting this document, um, I found its aesthetic to be deeply rooted um, in 90s technoculture in, in a way that is so much more evident to me now than it was, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2005. Uh, you know, and, and we see through it uh, the way that the content um, picks up on elements of, of cyberpunk, sci-fi, 60s counterculture, rave culture, um, you know, and even through the, the choice of fonts, uh, some of the language um, really plays into the aesthetic. Um, and I think, you know, some of the, the content also reflects a, a convention um, of the time, which was to look outside of, of dominant white culture to reimagine radical um, possibilities for the future. Um, and, you know, in some ways, it also makes me think of, of the impulse of rave culture and sampling. And so we see that at work in the manifesto, um, you know, and how it kind of cribs subaltern methodologies about place um, through references to Aboriginal and, and Indigenous ways of knowing. You know, and I think if this document was written um, in 2021, these these passages um, and ways of, of thinking with um, these approaches and methodologies would probably be um, threaded more subtly and, and with deeper contextualization. Um, but, you know, this effort that was being made in 1999 to create tangents um, from kind of a dominant technoculture, I think was also a response to how the internet in its utopian ideal um, was failing to live up to its promise. Uh, and so, you know, we see in 1999, um, the, the corporate enclosures of the World Wide Web were obvious. Browsers like Netscape um, and Internet Explorer were using cookies um, and tracking people online. Um, people had no idea um, that they were being tracked in this way. And, you know, I'm not suggesting that it was cookies that spurred the manifesto. Um, but I think we see, you know, through this text, um, how the author is really trying to envision um, or imagine how the internet could be decentralized um, in physical space through location aware or location based technologies. Um, so in some ways, you know, maybe like part of the utopian impulse was the anticipation of how the internet, you know, when it's set free in, in the physical world um, or the way it was being conjured at the time, could live up to, you know, its potential to allow um, citizens uh, to access these technologies. Um, and, you know, I think there's elements to it that are exceptionally creative, um, experimental, playful, poetic, um, and it was ahead of its time in, in so many ways. This was written six years before Tim O'Reilly coined the term Web 2.0, um, and eight years before Apple um, first introduced its, its smartphone. It was a really pivotal time, wasn't it? And I think when you think that there was there was this whole sort of digital culture, there was this whole emphasis on the internet, sort of, and, and there was, I think they call it calm computing, this idea that everything mm -hmm. comes to your, your desktop or your computer. And so the whole world's literally at your fingertips. And suddenly the sort of the situation's changing dramatically there. But there was this whole almost fetishization about this idea that... <clears throat> that the world's coming to your desktop computer wasn't there. And I think this was sort of shifting that significantly. And yet it kind of comes out of it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, when you, when we think of like the, you know, so much of the text is about articulating this movement to, to physical space and place. Right. And as you said, it's about um, breaking through that, the enclosure of, of the, the computer terminal or, or the computer screen. And, and that's, really in some ways like a brave new world because, and, 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 and that's evident too when I look at the Headmap Manifesto. I mean, I have to say, 
the actual document itself, I find quite hard to actually work out which one was the first document because we're, we're talking about 1999 that it was meant to be written. But mm -hmm. when I'm looking for it online, I'm sort of getting a, a number of sort of iterations here. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I'm not, it's, it's really hard to, to trace. Um, uh, and even to, to be able to find the, the correct um, iteration, I think using the Wayback Machine was, I was able to kind of trace it back as far as I could, but it's hard to exactly pinpoint, you know, that original, that original mm. file. Mm. I've been into way back when, and I find it quite hard to find and negotiate my way around there. Mm -hmm. But I suppose, I mean, I, I feel like when I'm looking at the head map manifesto, I feel like I'm sort of plugged in on someone who's really, you know, really kind of in, um, in, in an extraordinarily powerful way, sort of he's, he's almost riffing with the idea of what this new technology will do or or the capacity mm -hmm. to suddenly go from our desktop computers and be mobilized out there in this much more sort of um, location or, or locative. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are we talking about with location-based media? What are we, what's going on here? Well, you know, I think that this was, I mean, obviously even before the, but it's the internet of things, right? I think some of that language was, was being used, but it was like, what would it mean almost, you know, in, even when I read it, when I read it in um, 2005, I, you know, had a really hard time thinking with the piece and trying to imagine precisely, you know, what these um, sort of living or alive or, you know, um, um, sensing devices would be like. Um, and, and what it would mean to create these kinds of spatial, these networks um, in physical space where, where people were essentially um, connected, right? Through line of, you know, beyond just kind of line of sight or wire that we would be unwired and, and connected. Um, and this idea of annotation, right? Annotating space. Um, I found it incredibly difficult to envision. And going back to the text now, um, you know, it was this kind of remarkable experience of thinking like, oh, okay, like being able to kind of, you know, follow the text and immediately conjure examples that, you know, we've either, we've, we've either lived through um, or that we are, are currently living through with, with um, through technologies. And even the, the text itself, you know, there's this, this, um, you know, the form takes a very layered approach. There's, um, I was able to track kind of five um, intersecting narratives where you have like the the direct quotes that kind of accentuates um, the dialogue that the, that the author's putting forward, um, you know that it, that uh, Russell's in in dialogue with with these authors and in, in pulling in these, these which, quotes. Which authors are we talking about here? Because there's some really um, interesting stuff he's pulling. So some of the reliance on particular authors, you know, somewhat dates the text for me, but I mean, you know, we're talking about 22 years ago. Yeah. Then there's these fragments. It's the fragments I think that. I call them fragments that stood out for me, um, you know, these words and phrases that um, annotate the themes. Um, and this is obviously pre-Twitter, but reading it now, I thought of how interchangeable these fragments are with, with tweets and, and that kind of writing convention. Um, and then there are these observational um, and experiential insights from the author's own experiences. And, you know, I thought going back to it, that Russell doesn't have this any kind of overbearing presence. And I found myself at times, you know, trying to really want to suss out the author's stance. Um, and so one of the, you know, as a, as a text to kind of think with, I think Russell offers a presentation of facts, um, you know, about particular technologies that are in existence with these intersecting ideas and ask the reader to do a lot of the interpretive work and, and thinking, and imagining, imagining, excuse me, for themselves. Then we have these images, right, that kind of work as a narrative. Um, and finally, the subtitles. And the subtitles for me um, really serve as uh, a roadmap through the text, right? And so all together, I think you really get this kind of compelling document that is meant to provoke um, and ask people, well, in 1999 or 2003, whenever that was, to to think about the possibility right, and what it would mean to um, not necessarily create a radical break from the present, um, but to sort of imagine, or sorry, yeah, to create a radical break from the present, but to imagine 
you know, alternate possibilities of, mm. of being in the world. Mm. Look, it, it, um, it's such a rich text, isn't it? Such a rich text. Mm -hmm. There's so much that you could talk about with the Head Map Manifesto. I'm curious, um, Andrea, in 2005, where were you sort of at in your life and, and how come you, why did you kind of intersect with this? What were you doing at that time? Yeah, so in 2005, so I was doing my um, doctoral uh, research at Concordia University um, in Montreal. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, I, I first came across this, this text that was, was peppered in, in a few other um, documents on, on locative media. Um, and it was really after I started working um, as a research associate on um, a multi- institutional multi-million dollar project in, in Canada called the Mobile Digital Commons Network that I actually kind of came into the folds of, of mobile media or, or locative media. Um, and that project was really focused on uh, creating um, co-locative mobile experiences in Banff, uh, Toronto, and Montreal. Um, and so my research or my kind of foray came through, you know, and I think it's important to acknowledge more of a, a research, like it, the research institution. In working in this kind of collaborative formation. Um, and it was through this experience that I thought, okay, there's something here, right? Going to the project, I had never even heard of Bluetooth. You know, it was this, just this entirely new domain for me. Um, and it fascinated me and intrigued me, and I wanted to know more about it. And, and that's really sort of what, what became my focus of research. And you went out in the field and you did a bit of work at that time, didn't you? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so there were, I mean, there was the kind of work that was happening in this project. Um, um, there was work that I did uh, through a residency at the Banff New Media Institute. Um, and I think both of those um, um, provided an opportunity for me to think about, you know, what it means to actually produce these projects to produce locative media and the kinds of tensions that exist um, through the production um, or through the realization of the of these projects. I just want to read just a, a, just some quotes here that I've just highlighted, sure. um, and, and and this is from the actual. I think this might be from the two thousand and five version, but it's got things like mm -hmm. you know it's just got things like real borders, boundaries, and space become plastic and malleable. Statehood becomes fragmented and global. I mean, that's a very powerful sort of thing to say. Mm -hmm. Statehood becomes fragmented and global. It's like a kind of a breaking down of sort of the national borders. Uh, cell phones become internet enabled and location mm -hmm. aware. Everything in the real world gets tracked, tagged, barcode and mapped. Now, he uses mm -hmm. this analogy, I think, um, at, at a certain point where you'd walk into a restaurant and mm -hmm. on your mobile phone, there would be things like a, 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 a sort of a, a, a nasty image, and that would sort of suggest that someone's been there and they didn't like the restaurant. Now, that was a real sort of forerunner to things like, you know, the, the wayfaring apps, Foursquare, and a lot of mm -hmm. that stuff. But, but I guess that's kind of, we've seen that play itself out um, fairly mm -hmm. evidently with the um, locative media. But it's, for me, coming from sound trails and the work that I've been doing, I'm particularly interested in his sort of reading on the connection to country. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, that um, you know, he, there's, there's a whole sort of section here called law and land. Um, the ability to annotate space using location-aware devices will allow new concepts of land ownership and community and calls into question the geographical basis of power, politics, and law. So I think there's another sort of, for me, a much more kind of complex kind of thing than just sheer annotating sort of public space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I think that that whole argument that unfolds there, you know, what, what struck me kind of off the bat was um, the use of, of recolonization because, you know, coming from a, a Canadian context where our collective efforts is towards decolonization, um, you know, first I was like, okay, this is, you know, we're using this terminology. But in 1999, I think what's being suggested is that, um, you know, spaces ought to be reclaimed reclaimed in, in all the ways that we understand the conventions of space. And so absolutely, it's not just about, you know, leaving these kind of uh, virtual markers um, that others can find, but in, in, in some ways using um, 
location-based um, tools or technologies um, to actually have us reconsider what we mean around location, right? To use it as a, um, a, a tool to, to generate new ways of thinking about it. And reclaiming space is a really interesting idea because for me, I, I find myself often feeling a little bit um, just underwhelmed, I suppose, by the whole way in which sort of gaming or, 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 or places like Foursquare or Yelp are, you know, kind of obviously underpinned by locative media. But when it comes to that idea of sort of unpacking kind of voices and stories and memories mm -hmm. and, and sort of counter narratives, then, then I'm suddenly sort of notice that I'm I'm sort of sitting up and much more interested and and I, I suppose you know coming back to your paper um, um, a location of one's own you know there's this mention of these early projects that were working pre smartphones you know things like Esther Pollock's the Milk Project uh, Paula Devine's the surveillance stuff that was going on around the Iraq mm -hmm. War I mean these were really kind of out there and quite um, uh, they're, they're making a, a big statement, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, a lot of, and I think that is also, um, you know, indicative of the works that I was in, engaging with in particular ways that were coming out of, um, you know, this this field of, of locative media at, at a particular time. Um, and to me, those works were also in conversation with uh, the Headmap Manifesto and the way they, that they were trying to re-engage or reimagine, um, or uh, you know, articulate new possibilities for how we talk about space, like Paula Levine's um, example was really interesting in, in the overlaying of, of, of maps to allow individuals that are you know thousands of, of miles apart to, to think about you know how in fact we are more connected than we think. Right, that 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 we are, you know, very much um, experiencing um, similar modes of of civil unrest, for instance. Because she was layering, I think, material that she was getting around the time of the invasion of Iraq. She was mm -hmm. layering that on cities in America. Is that what, is that what That's she right, was doing? Yeah. Right, and that we, yeah, to demonstrate the kind of implications that yeah. it's, you know, these things are happening there. But what starts to happen when you envision it in your own immediate urban space? And and this man whose name I'm, I'm forgive me Ricardo uh, Dominguez. Dominguez, yeah. yeah. I mean he was he. I mean he was doing some stuff with the Mexican border where I think people were coming across from Mexico, mm -hmm. and he was providing through through this um, this app I think that he did this mm -hmm. kind of compass where they could sort of track where they were going. There were things like water sources. There was instructions mm -hmm. on how to get through the fence. I mean, these are fairly contentious and in your face in, in terms of the American government. Um, um, so you, you see that these sorts of projects were really informed by the Head Map Manifesto? Well, I think there were certain, I mean, I can't say if they were necessarily stemmed directly, but I think there were, there are certainly threads there around um, the the ways that these these technologies um, co-create communities, right, in radically new ways, and I think these projects were were doing that a little bit, certainly. Yeah, um, I've been told that I should actually kind of just draw on a few comments. So I'm going to look over here Thanks. to YouTube, and I've got someone mentioning that um, Andrea, you mentioned that. Uh, there were a number of authors of Headmap Manifesto, and I think um, someone here is referring to um, oh. what what's actually happened to Ben Russell and, and who was actually you know a part of that initial document. Oh yes, I as far as I knew, if, I mean I know very little about the sort of the development of the, of the document outside from the fact uh, that this person Ben Russell wrote it. But I think the folks that I did mention. Um, uh, it had to do with, I believe that I enc first encountered reference to the manifesto through the work of Mark Tudors. Uh, and so there were a, a bunch of folks writing about locative media at the time as it was unfolding. Um, but I'm sorry to say, you know, I don't know much about it. And even, you know, even in kind of preparing for today, there's, 
still not much to be found that gives kind of any kind of background to to the text. So in um, the the head map manifesto, I think both of us kind of agree it's got this really sort of you know the the future can be a brave new world. We can really open up. We can break down borders. We're much more connected. So it's quite utopic in its in its sort of um, in its vision. Um, it, but it falls over at a point, doesn't it? This this sort of idea of utopia here. Yeah, I think so. I mean, reading it especially now in in twenty twenty one. Um, there was sort of a, a moment that I thought about, you know, how, like, it's it's balancing, you know, so so much of what is talked about in 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 a more critical way, or even this idea of, you know, the the text takes up this notion of of recalls and recolonization. We've kind of seen this happen in different ways um, through, you know, the way that like big tech has sort of come to the foreground. And so when it's mentioning things like the text, the text itself is mentioning Burning Man, I think it's a festival for art and self-expression, um, you know, as this example of a kind of boundaryless or autonomous or off the grid um, space, you know, it's been co-opted by, by big tech or the text also mentions Napster. Um, and, you know, one of the co-founders of Napster was the first, you know, president of, of Facebook. Um, and so I think like, you know, the, the text is balancing the radical or utopian possibilities for the civilian use of these location-based or location-aware technologies, all the while pointing to us how these technologies, you know, are, are embedded. Um, they can never not be embedded in commercial or, or military um, infrastructures. And so it's mindful to the fact, I think, that there's also a danger of equating something like locative media um, with idealized democratic values because its practices and its infrastructure relies on and also moves fluidly between um, private and public interests. And I think that that resonates, resonates today. Yeah, and this is something that's, um, I think, fairly key to um, people who might call themselves sort of working within the psychogeography movement. I don't want to mm -hmm. get too sort of theoretical, but um, this idea that that um, you know the the the, the, the this from the, which I think is connected to the situationists um, and mm -hmm. I, and again I don't want to kind of get too yeah. caught in a rabbit hole here but it's this idea that we we can sort of liberate ourselves from sort of the power and the structure and control as we kind of move around and with there's some freedom and ability to, to sort of direct our own lives and choose our own paths and yet meanwhile locative media is completely built on this um, spatial uh, mm -hmm. mechanism that's that's pinning everything in the world to latitude and longitude points and there's 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 huge implications there for surveillance and and control so there's a real kind of paradox here isn't there absolutely absolutely and I think you know it's also a way to think about I guess for me you know I've always maybe in that way, that's why I've been drawn to certain projects in particular, because of that paradox and how they draw out the tensions in, in particular ways. And do you think that um, those paradoxes, I mean, I, I get the feeling that Russell, you know, he was obviously really ahead of his time and there was that sort of utopic feel from the late 90s that was kind of on the back of this whole um, uh, digital cyberpunk culture. And he's saying we're going to break out of this, mm -hmm. but do you get the feel that that um, um, there's still really kind of huge relevance here for this document today for the work that's going on? I've thought a lot about about that that possibility, and you know, I I think so. I think so in in the way that it. Um, you know, in, in the sense of like a historical mindedness, right? That I think the value is in, in the, the way that what's being advocated for is this deep engagement with experience of place first and foremost, you know, and then how these um, location aware technologies can augment and deepen one's connection to place. And so I think in that respect, absolutely. 
Um, but I often found myself thinking of the ways that the text would be rescripted if it were written in, in 2021. And I think that's a really valuable exercise too, to take the kind of the core thinking and arguments. You know, if he was if it was being written now, I suspect we would see, you know, elements in there taking up um, indigenous data sovereignty or AI and racial justice, right? So just kind of like shift the narrative in the way that we've shifted our narratives to 2021. Wouldn't that be a fascinating thing for someone to take a head map manifesto and to rewrite it today and in and, and, and context of kind of all these things that are going on? Um, I, I mean, I remember when I was a kid and, and my mum, uh, you know, as a, as a good sort of um, lefty hippie, she used to have the <laughs> Whole Earth catalogue. And I remember looking through that as a kid and, yep. and getting this sort of window into American counterculture at the time. And it was really in some ways like a script sheet for... Uh, an alternative world. And I suppose there have been these moments, you know, many, many of these sort of moments where communities or sort of visionaries um, will, will put these documents out that sort of suggest there's a different way of doing things. And I think for me, when I look at the Headmap Manifesto, you know, Russell's really sort of putting it out there through this idea of, 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 of spatial technologies, that this too is a possible new direction that we can go in. Mm -hmm. I think so, you know, absolutely that the, the if anything, it's, it's not that we have become more bound in the last, you know, 22 years, but that technology itself is, is continuously being spatialized in, in new ways. Um, and so the, the, the kind of core argument of, that is being um, threaded through that text, I think, still, still stands. Um, and especially for the need to imagine, you know, the, the, the ways that you know we can build community um, through um, storytelling, through um, you know place-based engagement, um, that it's not just kind of you know we're all remote, all you know decentralized. So in some ways, I wonder if it's like a re-centralization of our of our experiences, of our collective experiences. Because the Esther Pollock's work, the Paula Levine's works, the Terry Rubes works, I mean, they're not so much about building community, really, were they? They were more about sort of pushing the envelope of what this new technology could do and, 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 and sort of, it was a very different sort of proposition there, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, I think there was still kind of an underpinning to some of those works about um, um, a shared understanding of, of placemaking. Um, and I think, you know, those, some of the works in particular, the kind of real time, um, is that Esther Pollock's work, the, the real time work, I mean, part of that was also the, the impulse to, to understand these technologies, right, that the kind of civilian ap application of, of GPS, for instance. Because, I mean, I just read the other day, GPS has been going since I think something like the 1960s, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yep. And, and then I think yep. in the 19, was it a 2000, in the 2000, they had some way of basically controlling how accurate G GPS could be. And I think in around mm -hmm. 2000, they kind of allowed that to then become a lot more accurate in terms of its reading. Yeah, I want to say, I mean, I should know, I should know this just like that, but I want to say it was under the Clinton administration. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 yeah but they were just able, like, it was exactly the, the, the precision um, just became unbelievable. And, and again, of course, that's going to change too with 5G, with all these mobile yeah. towers going up, the proximity yeah. uh, and the, the, the accuracy of GPS is going to increase again exponentially here. Mm -hmm. So this idea of, of us um, being able to sort of explore, I guess, this hybrid reality, this, um, this sort of digital sphere that kind of augments the world in which we're in, mm -hmm. the, 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 the potential here for new ways of imagining that world and the new potential there is, is, is quite extraordinary. Yeah, I agree. I think um, 5G in particular is going to present uh, kind of incredible new opportunities and also challenges and, and usher in or revisit or will have us revisiting some really important concerns so, around surveillance, for instance. So what does it mean to, to connect each other to this idea of place and belonging and meaning making and storytelling. What does that mean? Because that's, you know, that's one part of the head map manifesto. And I think it, mm -hmm. it comes across really clearly, particularly in relation to his kind of, you know, a lot of quotes on First Nations people, 
on the Aboriginal connection, things like song lines, things like the ancestral relationships and stories that are buried into land. What do you think that means today for, for locative media? And, and, and sort of, you know, are there any resonances of Headmap Manifesto that sort of draw that out for you? Well, I think so. And, and to be honest, I mean, that question, I would, if, if I may, actually turn it back to you and, and, you know, think about the work that you're doing, right, and how it picks up those, those threads in really meaningful um, and sustained ways in, in the, the communities that you're working with and, and the stories that um, are being shared and told. Well, thank you. That's a nice segue. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I guess one of the things that's really clear to me is when I look at a lot of work that's been out there with locative media and, and particularly sort of locative arts, is that it's usually been geared around festivals or a sort of an artist's portfolio as part of their, their, you know, it might be disruptive, it might be making a statement, it might be making people aware of surveillance. But I guess what I've not seen in my work over the last eight or nine years is a really systemic kind of way of building back through a stable platform voices, memories, stories, and sort of that deep ancestral sort of connection that we all have, you know, to our community, to other people in the community, and to that place which kind of embeds us all. And that's mm -hmm. one thing which, which I felt often very frustrated about is that, you know, locative media can be quite sexy, you know, it can be the next best thing, but what sort of architecture is there and what sort of projects are there that are out there that are using locative media to, I guess, sort of re, re patchwork and, and, and place back in our stories and the, the ordinary stories or the extraordinary ordinary stories back within a locative framework. Because for me, uh, you know, and I'm really passionate about this, this is where I think it's, it's both, and we were talking about this before we came on air tonight, um, this is where it's both, locative media is both sort of ordinary and that there's, people whose stories, uh, you know, are, are very commonplace. But it's deeply political in some ways because it's challenging those sorts of traditional narratives that are out there, you know, the traditional war monuments, the, the sanctions sort of um, public uh, uh, sort of memorials. And it's kind of saying, hang on here, there's this raft of kind of other stories, other sort of trajectories, other, other uh, perspectives. So for me, that's where I really sort of get where Russell's coming from because I think he was really pointing to this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a little bit sort of embarrassing to read the stuff that he's writing about um, some of the First Nations people because mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a degree of kind of mythologizing there and almost sort mm -hmm. of a, a romanticness about it. Mm -hmm. But I also do think that, you know, he, he is talking to that, that deep connection that we all have to place uh, and, and, and what that means for us to feel that we're, we've got a part in that place. Well, absolutely. And I think there's, um, you know, in the text, he, he talks about, um, as I think I have, let me see, sorry, I have this quote somewhere, a new site for old discussions about the relationship of consciousness to place and other people, a context within which to explore new and old models of communication, community, and, and exchange. Um, and, you know, that stands out to me. And again, that, you know, there's the, the emphasis on, you know, deeply engaging with, with, with place, right? That it's not just this kind of fetishization of, of technology that, you know, you can sort of create this, this interactive, let's say, interactive piece or installation and that, that'll suddenly, you know, transform your understanding of, of place, but it's more than that, right? It's also about you know, understanding the past in order to understand the present. And so again, like I said earlier, there is a historical mindedness, I think, to the, to the, uh, we can call it an agenda that the, the manifesto is trying to, to set out. Um, and of course there are, you know, there are limits to that argument given its datedness. Um, but, um, you know, there are, there are the kind of core, theme and thesis that's that's threaded throughout this document around communication, community, um, and exchange, I, I think is is still the kinds of themes that um, 
those who are working in, in locative media, even if they're if they're calling it locative media um, anymore, are are also um, in, indebted to and, and thinking about. I was just thinking too, Andrea, that you know I was talking about the the ordinary stories and and the the bringing those to life, but I do think that it's a much bigger sort of canvas here that we're talking about because I'm thinking of, of, of people like Duncan Speakman and the work that he does. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the things, if, Duncan, forgive me if you're listening out here and I'll probably get this wrong, but I think, you know, he's, he's sort of talking about it, the, the, the spatial storytelling or the spatial sort of experience isn't necessarily linear. It can be, it can be I guess, this whole new sort of canvas which we've got to explore. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that that I feel like the the road that I've gone down has been in some ways a sort of more conventional narrative sort of road, where we've uh, you know we're commissioned to do projects, we create a compelling sort of sound piece that takes people around a location. Obviously, you know we need some sort of narration there. We need a sense of of, of the choreography of the piece. Mm -hmm. But I think. The flip side of that could be that, hang on, guys, it's a whole new sort of canvas to play with here. What does storytelling mean? What does kind of, you know, mm -hmm. is, it, is it a linear process or is it a sort of an ad hoc kind of piecemeal process mm -hmm. in terms yeah. of, of how we do this? Yeah, absolutely. Is it authored or is it being co-authored? And I think, like, that's one of the um, things that make, again, lo locative media or whatever we, we're calling it um, really compelling. Is that it offers so many possibilities for placemaking, for storytelling, for um, collaborative engagement, right? And I get the feeling that back in 1999, when Ben Russell was was um, conceiving this headmap manifesto, I get the feeling that he was probably drinking a lot of coffee and he was envisaging these possibilities and he was getting very excited. And it's it's almost like this this headmap manifesto itself is sort of a a dossier of of sort of these these sort of moments of sort of complete sort of excitement that he's having in terms of the way he's visioning what the future might look like. I think so. I think it's you one can definitely get a sense of those those punctuations of like the I don't know, sometimes with my students, you know, that ha aha moment um, that is threaded throughout. And I think that also propels the the reader forward too in feeling that um, inquisitiveness and excitement about the possibility. I remember the first time that I explored locative media, and it was it was back probably, oh crikey, about nine years ago. Uh, and the producer Francesca Panetta uh, came to Sydney, and she was doing a workshop there. And we were using, uh, I think it might have been one of those early iterations of App Furnace. And I remember going down to Haymarket in Sydney. And being a little bit nonplussed about it, and I had an iPhone three, and walking into these stories which we produced in the ABC store in the ABC studio, and kind of going, "Oh my God, this really works! This really mm -hmm. brings to life sort of the world around us with the voices, with going from left channel to right channel, with you know, sort of the imagine, the whispers, the sort of this, mm -hmm. and this kind of weird sort of." porous membrane between the real world around us, the tactile world, what we can see, what we can smell, what we can feel, and this digital material which is which is sort of beaming down to us. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go from that, but I, I guess one of the things that I do sense with people who are working with, with locative media, particularly at this more sort of creative end, is that people get bitten by a bug once they've actually gone out there and they've experienced it and they've sort of had a sense of how well, particularly for me, audio is is such a beautiful way to augment and and sort of and to 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 build that mm -hmm. imagined world. It's hard to go back. Well, I think there's something too about it, and you know, in in these experiences that they're they're very it's embodied. Um, and you know, if there's audio involved and you're wearing headphones, it's also kind of like a, you have a cocooning experience where it's also very personal and private, even though you may be um, in a very public space. And so I think, you know, it does well at um, moving through those tensions and bringing someone into the experience. And I think that's also part of what makes it 
challenging, right? It's not just sort of someone sitting down and creating an experience, but it's the kind of the 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 aesthetics, the um, uh, technical proficiencies in the place or space itself. I love that sense of the intimacy that you're talking about there, because that's really what I get when I when I walk around some of these places. Just got a few comments coming in here. The first one. Um, uh, someone's referring to, it was a flaming skull, I think, that, that Ben Russell refers to when he walks mm -hmm. into a restaurant. It's a flaming skull that suggests that it's a bad review. Don't go there. Uh, another one, um, for the last two decades, uh, uh, has seen a capturing of the discourse around locative media by big tech. Uh, more recently, we've seen growing backlashes against this ladder. Is this a trend or a glitch? It's an interesting question, isn't it? It is a good question. Is it a is it a backlash or is it a glitch? You know, this idea of a backlash yeah. against big tech and the adoption of the term locative media. I mean, let's not get too technical about locative media because we yeah. know that's not, it's going to end in tears. But I think it brings up a, a really crucial point about the term is that it for me it always feels like it's it's a contentious phrasing that people are always kind of moving, you know, towards it or against it in different ways. Um, I mean, I don't, I wish I knew the answer to that question, but I think it, there is, there's a tension about the term. Because of course, big, big tech it sits right there underneath all of this, doesn't it? I mean, you can be as contentious, as disruptive, as provocative yeah. as you want using yeah. this platform, but you're still using spatial geolocative technologies that are bringing <laughs> but to I mean, life. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's always been sort of the, 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 the tension of, of locative media that there's, very few ways to move outside of that. Even if you're using, you know, even if you decide I'm not going to use GPS um, and you're using a mobile device, I mean, it's still kind of implicated um, in the, you know, extraction of natural resources and, you know, indentured labor. So there's, you know, it's, I think, crucial to understand how that, um, those asymmetries of, of power exist as, as part of the, the infrastructure. Oh, power is writ large in the whole thing, isn't it? And I remember when you were telling me before about one of these early projects that you were working in in Canada and you said you were out there with this really highly expensive sort of gear and meanwhile mm -hmm. all around you were these, these sort of homeless people who had clearly, you know, were, 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 were right off the radar, um, terrible metaphor to use, but, they, you know, they, it's, it, it was a very privileged sort of domain and perhaps still is a quite a privileged domain to be working in. Absolutely. But I think, you know, the, the fact that there, that there's an effort being made to create, let's say platforms, you know, for, for offering, um, you know, otherwise, how do these works get, how do we sustain these works and how can we create communities around, um, you know, location-based experiments or locative media or whatever, you know, we want to call it um, without a kind of platform to, to bring folks together. And so again, I think that's where your work is really um, important um, as an intervention into, I guess, the, the continuation or, or who knows, the, the new path that locative media will take. I'm, I'm just curious, we've got a couple more comments here that I want to get mm -hmm. to, but I'm just curious, you know, have, have, how have your sort of feelings about locative media and your involvement in locative media changed in that sort of intervening 16 years since you first kind of cottoned onto it? Um, I think so. I think, you know, um, my own understanding, you know, certainly early on in, in those, those dissertation years or research years, you know, I had a, a very clear understanding in my mind about what locative media is or was or, or what it ought to be. Um, and I don't, I haven't felt that way in a while and I'm kind of just interested to see you know, how it's taken up. Um, and this goes back to, you know, a, a question that you had asked me, I think in a previous conversation, Hamish, about, you know, that the field of forces, right? Like what is locative media as a field? And it's like, it's always being taken up in different ways. It's, it's contentious. Pe different people claim it or don't claim it or reclaim it. Um, and so I just, I don't, you know, I've sort of kind of sit, moved back and just observe, you know, how it's progressed in different ways. So would you say you're less convinced today that it can actually be a powerful tool for for sort of change? No, I don't think so. No, no, no. I don't. I don't think that that way at all. I think I'm less convinced that it needs to be confined to a, a particular mode of like 
making art. I think that's what I'm less convinced about. And I'm happy to see it taken up in a multitude of ways. And I think that there, well, there are examples of the ways that it's doing really crucial and important work in bringing people together or, or even aesthetically in, in the kind of work, the amazing work that, that's being done um, through a new kind of aesthetics for, for location-based experiences. And I suppose if we kind of come right back to the Walk, Listen, Create team, that's pretty much what they're doing. They're trying to sort of build this community and get this dialogue going and support and inspire people to to explore new ways of doing this because it does feel like it might have been around now for, you know, 20, 30 years in essence, mm -hmm. but we're still very much at the tip of the iceberg here, aren't we? I think so. And I mean, you know, I, I'm also a, a media historian. So sometimes I look at, you know, technologies as like the kind of a long arc of technologies. And I, and I think it, it, it makes sense that it, that it will evolve as the technologies evolve and people take up, uh, take it up differently and in new ways. Uh, okay, a few comments here. Uh, for the last two decades, uh, has seen a capturing, well, we've done that one. Uh, Andrea is correct. Clinton ended the in in intentional scrambling of GPS in 2000. I think they might have been scrambling it because they were concerned that people could deploy bombs or, you know, satellite <laughs> stuff. So I think that might have been underpinning that. Another comment, uh, Christian Knowles, 2004 mm -hmm. biomapping artwork. Biomapping, yes. that's interesting. Do you know that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one. I think I even wrote about it. That's where... He was using um, the, the kind of lie detector technology, I believe. Yeah, so I do know those. I do know that one. Yeah. Yeah. So Christian Christian Knowles, two thousand and four biomapping artwork is a good example of visionary exploration of our intimate body and mm -hmm. mind relation with the public space. Is embodied cognition a topic of the manifesto? Very much so, don't you think? I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think that term is ever used, um, but it's certainly there. Yeah. Yeah, the I mean, this term embodiment is 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 quite sort of moot here, isn't it? It's one of those one of those sort of things, and and this idea of um a um an embodied experience, uh, mm -hmm. and and it's certainly you know there's been a lot of um, uh, um and it, it, there's been many attempts from from my perspective. There's been many attempts from people who are working with things like VR to claim mm -hmm. you know the 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 immersive uh, catchphrase. Um, and the embodied immersive thing is sort of they're almost kind mm -hmm. of cousins, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I always find VR much more a sort of simulation, whereas I find when I'm out on yes. the field, the locative stuff, particularly um, the idea of sort of storytelling being unpacked in relation to the place around mm -hmm. me, I find that much more sort of embodied. Exactly. I think it, it brings a certain kind of awareness to your body in, in place and space. And, you know, depending on the work, it, it will heighten um, your senses in different ways. I've got one more question. Is collaborative okay. locative media, locative media 3.0? <laughs> Thanks, Fred. That's, that's a statement. That's not a question. <laughs> He's got a, a great question statement. mark on the end. <laughs> He's got a question mark on the end. I think these are very smart questions that are coming in. They are. They're excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just in relation to that, I guess when you when you pin uh, the head map manifesto, it was pre Web two point zero, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. It was. I mean, it was pre nine eleven. Yeah. You know, which was kind of monumental in you know, surveillance technologies mm -hmm. and the whole surveillance theater, particularly in North America. I should, I should contextualize that. Yeah. But yeah, it was. How many years? I think I said six or something years before the the coining of that term. Yeah. Yeah. That even the participatory. I don't even think we were using that that terminology um, in 1999. I want to say that was 2004. Yeah. Around there, right? Even the the capacity. Um, I guess it came about more around you know YouTube and participatory media, and the promise of of you know everyone being able to be a producer of one's work and, and, um, you know, the, the, the potentials for like alternative media models to really, to really take hold, I think was, 
is what that's also rooted to. Oh goodness, that's a whole new discussion, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll pass models, that. Uh, I would <laughs> but love it's to. All connected. It's I all connected. would love to throw that out to journalists <laughs> at this stage to kind of cotton on to locative media and start <laughs> thinking outside the framework of the conventional journalism model because I think locative yeah. media has got so much to offer. Look, I think we have to wind it up there. Um, and um, I do apologize to anyone who's still with us for the delay in starting. Uh, I would just, Andrea, if there's anything you want to just finish up with, I might just kind of conclude this conversation. No, you go ahead. I just would like to say thanks to, to everyone, but please go ahead. Uh, look, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much again for agreeing to be um, in this with me today. It's really it's wonderful, particularly because, as I said, the, um, the, um, the essay that you wrote was so formative for me, and it's really nice to be able to do this within the context of Walk, Listen, Create and all that they're doing, and I hope that in some ways this can be a sort of a small contribution to sort of building, I suppose, a broader conversation around what locative uh, aware technology, situated storytelling, mobile storytelling what it's doing now and what these possibilities are for change making, for disruption, for building community. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you very much for, for being part of this. Thank you. It was a, it was a pleasure. And, and thanks to, the, to your producers um, and to the, the CAFE team also for making space for this conversation. I really appreciate it. Okay. Okay. So don't forget if you're out there listening, in two weeks' time, at exactly the same time, we're having another conversation with Jason Farman on the contention around locative maps. Another interesting topic. Well, for me <laughs> it is anyway. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.